G'day, Peter. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, great to be here. And great to have you, man. We finally got our calendars together and we uh, managed to uh, meet in uh, Skype world. And um, <laughs> really cool to have you on the program because part of what I like to do is share stories. I like to share people's stories. you all got an interesting story. It's around, um, you know, stroke and childhood stroke more importantly, but um, mm. we, won't get, we won't spill the beans completely on what the story's about until um, we get some part through the uh, interview because you've got something amazing to share which will offer hope and I think inspire people, regardless of how long they are down the path of stroke recovery, to continue going for it, you know, and to continue aiming for those uh, improvements and for the wins and not to get discouraged when, it seems as though they haven't had a win or an improvement for a little while. Can you tell me a little bit about your stroke journey, kind of how it started for you? I know it was early on in your life. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I don't uh, remember rem- remember much right before that. Um, I had uh, my stroke when I was only four years old. Yeah, that was a really big turning point for my life and my family's. Um, because back then they didn't have any data or any research on childhood strokes. Right. Um, and, yeah, it pretty much leveled me um, in terms of my abilities. So I had to learn how to balance properly and, and walk and understand how to use the arms properly, how to feel, right? um, how to listen, listen to different people around me. Um, control yeah just like all those very very basic things um and regulation so regulation of the of the senses and um yeah the stimulus input things like that um yeah so that's that's basically what i had to start from <laughs> um and build my way back into society so i've been doing that ever since so you were four years old. You probably just started walking, talking, feeling, doing all those things. And now four years into your short life, you're back to square one almost. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Do you know anything about what it was that caused you to have a stroke at age four? Um, no, it, it's still a mystery, really. Um, my Both my parents went back through like generations um, and there's been no – nothing like this before all right so it was a clot um lodged itself uh just behind my left ear in one of the big arteries um to to the brain so where the brain stem and the corpus callosum like the, the bridge part between um the right and left part of the brain right it have, it have massively affected the left hand side of of that that bridge my stroke was quite deep and i'm still pushing uh, those those limits of of what it did so yeah and it's 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 been a it's been a journey but um if you've if you have like all all these little problems um i guess it sets you up of of tackling life like um you you can't do this like do it right and i i've seen a little a few quick wins um back when i was younger and i just had that mindset of back then of um Life is is hard and is difficult, right? but if you if you can understand um, how the the principles work of how to get over those turtles, and it does take time, and the best most effective um, way to do it is be patient, be present, um, be very noticeable. Um, it will be a lot smoother in getting over those turtles. Yeah, it's interesting what you say, like. I, I did think that I had a lot of problems before I had the stroke. Um, there was definitely issues at work. There was different issues at home. Like we just had life issues that we needed to overcome, you know? Yeah. And then yeah. the stroke happened. And those issues seemed irrelevant and so minor in comparison. Yeah. It was kind of like, wow, like what, what a whinge I was. Now, not that I was a whinge, but, you know, just a normal human being, you know, just wondering. Why does all this sort of stuff have to happen to me? And you know, why does that guy not not turn up to work and all that type of stuff? 
Yeah. And then it was like, okay, so now that guy hasn't turned up to work, but I can't turn up to work either, like I'm completely stuck because of this yeah. stroke. So overcoming that stuff was a real learning opportunity for me. And I, I speak about that sometimes when I present to people about how we focus on things that are minor. Yeah. And that are irrelevant. And they stop us from doing things that are bigger and more important. And we're just not aware of it. And then something something massive happens in your life and then you become aware of it. So for yeah. me yeah. so yeah. for me it was a big opportunity to learn. And I was kind of grateful that I had this opportunity to learn at, you know, 37. Yeah. But you had that opportunity to learn at four. And yeah. you just being a normal kid, you would have gone about trying to be normal and just trying to interact with everybody in the same way that you would have beforehand. How long were you in hospital, do you know, before you were able to kind of get back to some regular life? Um, I was in hospital for a month afterwards, right? And the the, the doctors and um, physios and um, all that stuff was like, we have no idea what's what's going on, right? Um, but he's stable now, right? And since my mom was a nurse, um, she knew what to what to do, right? Um, what to um, like keep me comfortable, yeah. right? How to support me? So I was in the hospital for the next month. Um, over the next year, I stayed um, home roughly. I, I slept a lot, a hell of a lot. Um, about the year after, I, I went back to school, um, but in a supported supported environment. Mm -hmm. And it was really cool because the class um, and the whole year level actually did a whole project on me. So they came into the, the hospital, right, one classroom at a time, and saw me, right, and when I was asleep, and they explained what um, what was happening. So that was cool. Um, so when I came back to school, everyone knew what what had been going on. So when you when you end up going back to school, were you in a wheelchair? Were you walking? How was it? Yeah, yeah, I was I was walking, um, but I wasn't. Yeah, I was walking, but I couldn't run. So you know how you say about your senses were overloaded. Yeah. What does that mean? Because I don't know if it's similar to what I experienced. So on my left side, because I yeah. had the, um, the the bleed on the right side, on my left side, my fingers and, well, all of my skin is really hypersensitive to touch, mm -hmm. but it's not like that on the right side. And it's numb, but it's painful when, for example, like the cold air is blowing onto my left side. So yeah. what, do you, what do you mean when you say your senses were over heightened? Was it just that or was there other things as well? Well, um, it, was, um, it was painful, right? So the, when I used to get touched, touched too much, it became painful, mm. right? Really, really painful. It's like, um, have you ever had a migraine yeah. before? Yeah. Right? It's, it's like a, a migraine through the roof, right? Like um, I was screaming, um, I didn't didn't like light, and this is any sense, right? So feeling, hearing, um, things like that. It was just unbearable. Um, and how I've dealt with that is, I've looked internally and gone like, okay, there is nothing anyone can do externally. Yeah, I need to find out a way to deal with this internally, right? <laughs> because did you do that early on when you were young, or did you some is the skill that kind of came to you? As you sort of continue through life, it, yeah, it, it like um, it got less and less and less, right? And I realised um, I needed to control like my emotional state, yeah. um, or influence it uh, to it like, a, a huge degree. So I need to understand how the emotions work yeah. um, and how to manipulate uh, or influence the emotions. Nice, nice, yeah. Right? And that would help with the senses, right? Um, because it's like a, a driving force. Um, the the senses are only the um, the input, right? But tagged onto that is emotions, mm -hmm. and that's what I felt. And when the emotions were, when the senses were amplified, the emotions were amplified too. If the senses were amplified and the emotions weren't, it was easier to deal with. Yeah. So um, it sounds like did you. Was it some kind of a modality that you sort of used to help with that? So 
by my de- modality, what I mean is for me, I use meditation to manage similar things, right? Go internal and just observe what was happening to me and kind of do uh, a process that I felt was beneficial to me, which was what does it mean when I'm feeling these things? You know, how am I experiencing that? How am I talking about that? So it made me just pay attention and make myself aware. So meditation helped me connect in places I had never connected before. Mm-hmm. Like, was that something that you did or did you learn that through psychology or, or how did you sort of get to understand those experiences? Well, uh, I was only like six or seven, man. <laughs> so the, the, the psychology was, was uh, I, was, I was like, what, what's, a, what's a psychology yeah. <laughs> kind of thing? Um, I was around psychologists and psychiatrists oh, my whole life, and so I, I picked up on a few things. Yeah. One, um, it wasn't, it wasn't that. It was, or it was like a kind of meditation. Um, I understood breathing had a big influence on the emotions when you were young. Um, yeah, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. I, I would work out that. I would just like breathe in deeply. Um, I would like try and slow down. Um slow down uh the the emotions um that way and it it wouldn't work for like 99 percent of times but that one percent it would i was like that's a good thing <laughs> that's a good thing I'll, I'll, I'll stick to this until and over years and years and years it did right like so it, it slowly came down and i slowly um worked out that i need to put myself in situations which are noisy right where i'm going to get um, held right to push like the the sense level like through the roof right so i can practice on um calming down uh, so it's kind of so, like an immersion therapy where you go in yeah experience what's the what the pain is and then work out a way in your own way to manage it and to bring it down yeah. to a level that's not as terrible as what it is when it first started yeah 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 um and I don't know if it's um, my my family helped me out. So when I was um, twelve and um, and moved to Adelaide, and I was like, "Cool, I, I can I can get get on with this." Right, my sisters started dancing. Right, so they and we had wooden floors. Right, so the again that the noise level went through the roof. Right, right? and my senses would get overloaded, and then they started tapping. Right, tap dancing. So you you can imagine metal um, shoes on the wooden floors used to drive me nuts. Yeah. Right. Um and yeah, so it was a, it was just all all the things about um if I don't consciously do it, if I don't keep on on with it, all right, something is gonna happen in your environment which which um You can't control, yeah. Yeah, I can't can't control and it's gonna push you even further. So yeah, right. um but yeah, it's it's a good with my journey, it has been a good eye opening to what level of um, we can be pushed to, right, and what level we can come back from. I mean, with uh, with me in in primary school and high school, the only thing I wanted was a, a really good friend. Right? Yeah, at that time, like I was, I was uh, bullied, and like I'm sure a lot of other kids were. It's it's just like people are going to have problems all their life, um, but it's just how we look internally and how we deal with it and the best advice i've come up with is understand how your emotions work and control them um or influence them to a degree one of the things influencing your emotions is your internal voice so if you can influence that you can help your emotions calm down which helps body calm down which helps sensory sensory stuff calm down so yeah, yeah. Tell me about <laughs> tell me about being bullied at school. So, I know now being old. How old are you now? I'm thirty. So 30. I know I know at thirty you probably understand what's behind bullying more than yeah. you did when you were a kid. But what was it like to be bullied at school, especially when you're in the situation you were in? It was it had nothing to do with you. You didn't cause and nobody caused you, but except that you were in the situation you found yourself in and now people are giving you a hard time about it. Was that what you were bullied about or other things? Um, well, I was, a, I was a cheap target really So, in, in bullying. Um, so I, was, I had um, a, like a depression um, when I was younger and anxiety and um, 
and things like that. So I wanted to influence and, and influence the external environment, right? Because my senses um, got overwhelmed all the time, um, and wanting that, yeah, um, was a that that's what I wanted, and I I couldn't do it, couldn't do it, and I got pissed off because I couldn't do it. Um, and then you got people offside because you were pissed off and because you had all these yeah. special needs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was overweight and I couldn't um, couldn't use uh, one one arm. So, and yeah, I, I couldn't run. All right, so I still couldn't run. Um, and if if I did, I would get on a, I would fall over most most of the time. I would fall over and break something. So. I couldn't move anywhere, um, and I couldn't regurg- I couldn't talk very, very quickly. You know how people can like talk from the like the quick of the mind, and they um, they come back with an, um, another insult like two, two seconds flat, like yeah. or point uh, two seconds, right? And I'm like, I love those people, right? Those, those people are the best. Right? I wish I had like um, someone like Eminem right, as a as a good friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, to, to stick but, up for you. But you had to respond in your own time and that took a bit of, a bit too long, did it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it took minutes, right? Because like I would have to work out what they said mm. and normally um, what I think they said, they didn't actually say. So I, I, would, I would lose the, um, lose the information mm. and then try and regurgitate something um, in response to that when I had um, something called aphasia, if you're, you're aware of that. Yeah. Um, it, 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 yeah, it just was um, irritating to say the best because I knew what I wanted to say. I just yeah. couldn't say it. Yeah, so that's what aphasia is, right? It's the inability for the message to get to the mouth and then come out of the mouth. So you, you know how you want to respond, you know what you want to say. It's different for a lot of people, but yeah. in, your, in yeah. your case, it just it was like it's all happening here, but it's not coming out of here. So I know... I know how I want to swear at you, but I can't swear at you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's it. That's it. Um, and it was it was really really frustrating um, for me as a as a kid. And to now now I look back at it, um, and that that was my that was my world um, being bullied. And um, actually, I got called uh, the news uh, a few years later um, when I was about eighteen. The, the news kept up with that um, and caught it, and um, suddenly I was Adelaide's most bullied bullied kid, and I was like, I don't want that that label either. <laughs> so wow, so they were tr- they were trying to help, and they called you the Adelaide's most bullied kid, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so it it was just a um, it was in, in a turbulent times, really, really, so, really. Yeah, it would be, man. So. It's turbulent. We hear a lot of those stories about people getting bullied and it brings a lot of people to absolutely terrible places people have taken their lives because of it. Yeah. And you you had a difficulty just because of your left arm or your uh, right arm. You had all the issues that you had and you were bullied. And like now that you have got to the age of 30, you have this insight into being bullied and how you got through it. Have yeah. you had an opportunity to give advice to young people that are being bullied? And if they're listening now, like what would you say to them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So um, there's there's two. My my belief is is a, a different to a, a lot of other people's. All right. Um. So we have the the um, target. All right. Like I don't like to call them a victim because they're not a victim. Um, Right, they're just target of of energy. Right, they're they're a target, um, and that is being bullied, and the the bully himself. But they are both being bullied, right? But in different ways. So the bullied kid, right, is um, is having all this bullshit. Um, sorry, I swore. Right, um, all this stuff like hurled at him. Uh, and he doesn't know how to how to control it. The bully um, is also being like um, being bullied by his inner voice, his environment, right? Things like that, right? So they they have a common ground. It's just they deal with it in different ways, right? right. They they have forced they are forced to deal with it in different ways. Um, 
So one of and, them one of them lashes out and the other one yeah. accepts it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. But the the driver is the same, all right? But just the outcome is different. Um and the best thing I can say is look at what your uh, what you have, right? Everyone has um, everyone has gifts internally. Some people are, are very strong or very smart or very gifted in one area, right? So it's about understanding what that what that is first off, and then um, and then saying I'm good at that. No one can take that away from me. And then looking looking into like why am I being bullied in the first place, yeah. and for me, being bullied by so many different people and trying so many different different strategies, that taught me a lot about um, trying and trial and error. Right? You try something, it doesn't work. Try something else. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work. Try something else. It doesn't work. Try something else. You you will get you will get through it. Right? You will get through the bullying situation. Yeah. Um, did and you, did you have somebody to turn to during those times, like when it was really hard? Is it somebody that you could rely on? To... I I had I had um, my parents. Um, my parents were very supportive of my whole life and very caring and nurturing. So um, I'm I'm very very thankful for them. Um, but they didn't have the answers. So and I was very reactive as a as a kid. Um, some people might call me a, a, a delinquent, <laughs> uh, right? Because I, I used to lash out as well. Yeah. When, when, when I wasn't at school, my parents handled that as, as best they they could. Yeah. Um, with all that, it's just about. I got to a point where I couldn't try anything else, so I had to try dealing dealing with it, like um, looking into who they actually are, and they were just a really angry, aggressive kid because they have they have pain in their life. Yeah. Uh, they have hurt and really tapping into that through emotional um, emotional intelligence, I could really feel how they were feeling. Right. So even if they were they were really um, bullying me, um, calling me names, throwing stuff at me, um, I could really see through them and go, "Hey, like I could really see see inside myself and go, I know who they are." Right, they're just a scared kid. Yeah. Right, and I wouldn't react or respond as much as I, I, I could have. And did that make it better? Did it, by not responding as much as you did in the past, did that kind of alleviate it? Um, it 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 really it really depends on how how you've been been taught and how you've been brought up, really. Um, yes. But the, so depending uh, on the person who who was having a go at you, sometimes it may have alleviated things. Sometimes it didn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and the best thing I, I can say is like understand where the energy is going, yeah. right? Um, and try and try and use it. Right? So if someone um, called, uh, for instance, um, hey, four eyes, right? What what are you doing, four eyes? Like kind of stuff. Go like response, right? Take that and add on to it. I'm aiming for eight. Thanks for noticing. <laughs> right? Yeah, I wore glasses most of my life until I was 40, so um, I know all, the, all about the four eyes jokes. Yeah, 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 right? So try try and have some fun with it, right? Because, like, if you're, you're having fun, right, and they're trying to do exactly the opposite to you, um, it kind of breaks breaks a pattern in them that that's the way i I found out the the best way right and i had enormous information just coming in all the time about um what what was what was going on i I knew i could think it right but i couldn't say it and that gave me a little like huh all right i can i can i know what to say but i can't say it so that was okay yeah so you had a you had experienced uh the inability to walk at the beginning uh, you managed to get back on your feet, and you yep. you were pretty okay. You couldn't run. You also had aphasia, and you don't seem to have aphasia now. It seems like you're talking normally. Mm. Did, did that start to improve at a time that you can recall, or did it just continue to get better as well? 
it continued to get better um, slowly. Right, everything was was slow incremental steps. I, I couldn't like when um, you're at a a restaurant and and everyone talking, right, and you're having a conversation. I couldn't do that until about five years ago. All right, so wow. and five years ago, it it really picked up. Four years on, I'm, I can speak clearly and articulately, and um, I'm yeah speaking uh, around the country now. So, were you aware at the time of that thing called neuroplasticity, or is that something that you've learnt about later? Um, I innately, right in me, I knew um, about neuroplasticity when I was like like four or five, <laughs> um, my parents would say like how like all, all doctors and um, had the view back then that the brain was fixed, yeah. right? You can't do anything, the brain is fixed. And every single doctor said that. Mm-hmm. Um, he won't be able to walk, he won't be able to run, he won't be able to ride a bike, he won't be able to drive a car, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I was still doing it, right? And they said... Oh, he's different. Oh, he's special, or this like that. Um, so I, I I knew it, and I was like, this is weird because there should be other people like me out there. But everywhere I went, that there, there was just a a yeah, it was just a there wasn't those those type of people. And yeah, I just still kept pushing until um, about year two thousand, I think it was, mm-hmm. um, when. There was a book out titled Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Deutsch, yeah. right? And he, he blew everything up, right? So I'm like, oh, my God, thank God, right? There, there, is, there is at least a lot of people out there that, that do this stuff and have done this stuff. So until yeah. then, I, I felt like I was alone. And since then, I've just been really interested in neuroscience mm. um, because I have a, a personal um, story about it. Yeah. And... I've seen many, many uh, changes since. So yeah, I um, interviewed um, Michael Merzinger, who's a doctor uh, and a researcher who studied the brain, and um, yeah, on episode twenty-seven, and he was the guy that uh, worked in the team uh, with one of the first cochlear implants, so okay. they were restoring um, hearing to people who had lost their hearing. Yep. And at the time, they thought that they had kind of discovered this amazing technology that was going to help people hear. But in the interview, when I asked him about it, he talks about if it wasn't for the brain's ability to change itself, the yeah. technology would be useless. Yeah. So what was able to happen was the technology was able to send you know, sounds into the ear canal but the brain was able to pick them up in a way that it hadn't been able to do before, and it retrained itself to turn those sounds into something that was able to you know, be converted, just like we're yeah. talking now, and then as yeah. a result, people could begin to hear again. Um, yeah. So he started working on that in the 80s, and you know they struggled to get through all of the challenges about the belief that the brain was fixed and it couldn't be influenced or changed. And then they started doing more and more research on if the brain has changed you know, to enable this particular device to work and they were able to see it on scans and they were able to see parts of the brain that lit up once the device was installed as opposed to prior to that. If they could do that for that, what else could they do it for? And then with Norman Doidge and a whole bunch of other people you know, a lot of work started to come out about neuroplasticity and now we know it doesn't matter what you'll lose if you've got enough time and the damage isn't too dramatic you can retrain another brain another part of the brain to take up most yeah. most tasks yeah so yeah. for anyone that's listening whose child may have had a stroke really what we need to do is make them aware that um, children are probably in the best place to have a really amazing recovery because mm. they've got a lot of time in front of them. So if they're well yeah. enough and if their body's healthy enough, they are probably going to achieve most things that most children can achieve. And even if doctors are not so uh, comfortable in saying so, um, hopefully the parents are just not going to take no for an answer and they're going to just keep mm. striving mm. for good results like you got, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's like um, there's there's a few few things there that um that come to mind with um the doctors 
I, I reckon um, the doctors have been taught to say the worst case scenario. Mm. All right. Um, so anything better than that is like is a bonus. All right. Right. Um, in saying that, right, people are looking up to doctors, and if that's like that's the the the, the benchmark they're they're putting, right? Yeah. Then then I should aim for that and nothing else, mm. right? Um, so that's the first the first thing. The second thing is it's about like children having strokes. They have an enormous amount of time, and they're more adaptable. Yeah. And I can't remember what like. Um, what it was like before the stroke, right? Um, so when I was four, um, I can't, can't remember what it was like before. So I thought, okay, these guys have this, I have this, right? Let's let's do something. So I had, a, a, uh, in a sense, a clean slate, yeah. but I was well, well behind ev- everyone else. Yeah. Um, so I needed to work out exactly what to work on first and make some really big decisions. Um, do I learn to walk right and use my right arm, or do I learn to talk? All right. Um, since and that that was a big decision, right? right? And I naturally went down right the talking thing because I, I really wanted to get to know other people, right? And in going down that that path, I really learned about how energy works, right? Um, and I was working with uh, Brain Injury SA. Um, on a, on a few projects, and they say they say the same thing. It's it's a energy. What do they call it? An energy um, battery, right? So what what do you um, spend your energy on? Because uh, I'm sure you would agree that when you have a stroke, your energy is like it takes you a bit longer to recharge. to accomplish. Yeah, I recharge and accomplish your task. Yeah, yeah. So energy becomes very, very valuable. Yeah, yeah. And you've only got a certain amount of it yeah. and every day and you've got to make sure that you allocate the right amount to the things that you want to accomplish so that you don't run out of energy and then feel like you haven't accomplished anything. At least that was my experience, yeah. Yeah, 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 a- absolutely. All right, and um, so we became like, very, very like, um, I, I became very, very um, stingy right, on on my energy, and I was like, I won't donate to this, I'll donate to that. Yeah. Um, but I still wanted to wanted to push the limits, right? I still wanted to find out what's like. Um, I still wanted to be like everybody else, or um, accomplish things better than everybody else, right? And it took until I was like in my mid twenties. Um, to understand how that all lines up, yeah. and the fact that since I did have a a, a stroke when I was younger, um, what gifts that that gave me, where I can help other people in doing the same thing. I know a lot of people don't see it as a gift at the time, and I don't blame them. I certainly didn't think mm. the best thing that ever happened to me was a stroke as it was happening, but definitely looking back now. So in February for me, which is in a month's time. It will be six years since the first bleed that I had. Yeah. And um, in November last year was two years since my surgery, since brain surgery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, now looking back, definitely it's been able to be a blessing. But at the time it was, it was really tough for my family and everybody and for me. Um, But now um, having the podcast, connecting with people like you, I feel less alone. I feel like more people understand me, uh, I'm helping people just like you. And I, yeah. I enjoy that part because when I needed the help, I had some people reach out to me and that was amazing. That helped me get over the line, you know, so I'm just paying it back in my own way. Mm. And, yeah, um, yeah. And it's a good experience now. Um, I'm wondering, Peter, like how did you transition out of high school and then into, you know, the next stage of your life, which was after – after 18 and yeah did you go into the workforce like what did you do yeah yeah right so um i worked out that um because this was a mindset back then right you either um get a trade or you go to uni right that that, there were the two options Mm. um 
and I, I couldn't go to school because um, the, the work was getting harder and harder um, and I didn't understand foundational logic that, that well. Um, so I became really frustrated. So I went to went and tried to do a few trades um, and I, I kept getting held back because of my limitations. I got my first job at a Happy Wash, right, washing cars. Um, so that was interesting. <laughs> But um, it, it was it was a it was a cool it was a good job for me because it gave me a lot of time to really reflect and go okay where's my next step um, and I really had this internal since I've been battling problems my whole life mm. um, and a lot of people would say like really really big problems so mm. I, I I had that mindset of going okay cool where's the next problem where's the next problem where's the next problem to solve. Uh, and if there if there was no problems, it's like okay, you're look, not looking hard enough. Right? It's like there is a problem. If you don't spot it first, it's going to spot you and it's going to bowl you over. Right, right. So, so you're about preventing kind of things from creeping up on you. So you're very proactive. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that that's a that's a cool that's a cool trait. But I got to a point where I needed either year twelve, so I didn't finish year twelve, or I needed uh, uni. Right, so, and I, I did dabbled with it uh, for a few years. Um, I got my SACE um, because I, I worked for a number of years. Got my SACE, uh, went back to school, got my SACE, and well, did my what, last. What did you get your? I got my. Oh, um, it's about year twelve, right? Uh, your so certificate, I, your secondary school certificate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I tried to go to uni, right, to study. Like, um, I wanted to be a neuropsychologist or something like that because I, I thought like this is what neuropsychologists do right they help out with the brain and like um since i've been around psychologists my whole life and psychiatrists like i thought that was a good fit mm. until i understood the workload and like the reading reading and the graphics and and it wasn't everything i wanted it to be and so um after then i took mom's advice and went to in, like in did a set for in mental health. Mum always said like I would be a great social worker because I face everything that yeah. childhood could throw at you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. She's always been saying that. So, um, so I was like, all right, I bit the bullet and um, and tried that, and which led me to uh, the first first work experience um, and first real jobs. I was really really good at um connecting with with kids and um after that connecting with people with disabilities and brain injury um yeah. and fast tracked my way up to being on the board of south australia of people with complex needs because um, i could understand what it was like having those um having a disability and a brain injury as well as um like the psychologists, psychiatrists, and I could articulate between, um, at that time, I could articulate between the two roughly. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of your first sort of sort of way into coaching and helping people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so um, that's my first bridge um, between between the two because that, that job, that work ran out, so I kept learning and kept adapting mm. and – Eventually, a few years later, I've been to a, a number of courses now, yeah. and it's about. I like to think it's about um, prevention. Prevention is always better than a cure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, if you can prevent um, people being being obese and being overwhelmed and being um, burnt out, uh, having disabilities later in life because they push themselves too hard, right? If you can prevent that. Right. I rather think like, yeah, I, I would like to do that. Because yeah, and try and fix people when they're broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like trying to fix people when they're broken is is ten times harder than yeah. right, preventing it right from the beginning. So, hey, um, so you just started to talk again properly and articulate things correctly and sort of get through your aphasia five years ago. Man, what was that like when you realised that? My God, like I can actually make a sentence and I can articulate it 
without the delay and without all those challenges that you were going through beforehand? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, it crept up on me because uh, I, I always was looking for the problem. Where's the problem? Where's the problem? Where's the problem? Uh, um, and where, where can I improve? And it was my mentors actually saying like, hey, you can actually like string together like a number of words and you can actually like um, pitch what you do and like things like that. And I just turned around. I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> um, and so that you noticing. Kind of, so you kind of weren't 100% aware of it. Other people kind of said, hey, did you notice? Or... Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And I, I've been um, not noticing like the good points, mm. right? Always noticing like what's going to creep up on you and right, like bowl you over. Yeah, right. right. So your that, focus that, that, is somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My my mindset is like on what's the problem. Yeah. Right. And trying to prevent that or fix that or whatever. Um. So when when people said like, hey, you can you can jog, you can keep up with us. It's like, oh, wicked. Yeah, I can. All right. And all right, I've, I've just had no, like, my, that, that's not a, a focused area, right? And occasionally I go like, hey, I didn't used to do this before, right? Now I can, mm-hmm. right? And I feel like a sense of, like, gratitude, mm-hmm. right? But um, it's like, okay, cool. Um, and it only lasts for about a minute or so. And I was like, pat on the back. Let's get on with work, yeah. right? Let's let's get on with um, the, the things that are holding holding us back. Yeah, one of the tips that I give people now that I wish I had done was I never asked for somebody to record me, kind of like month one and then month two and then month three, just to sort of see what the changes were, and then yep. have them play it back and show me. Um, so that was a bit of an issue for me. Like um, I kind of would be seven or eight months down the track after you know the second bleed and struggling to type an email and all that kind of stuff because an email might take me you know two or three hours back then. And then um, one day I'd be sitting there typing an email and it would not have occurred to me that you know three or four months ago I couldn't type an email. So one of the good things that I was doing when I was seeing a psychologist regularly, I'd be seeing her once a fortnight or once a month. She would remind me that you know last month you were you weren't making sentences like that or you didn't yeah. remember this or whatever and I would go oh, okay wow well, thanks for telling me you know I didn't realize that I'd come that far along I really appreciate mm. you telling me um, so that reminder that opportunity for somebody else your mentor your family your loved one to remind you is a really good thing yeah yeah and, yeah, yeah. and if somebody's listening and they have a child who's experienced stroke. Maybe you want to start doing some recordings and then showing them, mm. like, this is where you were, this is where you're at now. That will, I reckon, really help a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, or, or, like, just uh, video journaling or something like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I found a, a few a few journals I, I, um, from a few years ago, and mm. it's like, wow, my problems have definitely increased since then, right? And... I see that that problem as like nothing um, anymore, and I see like it's like cool. I, I I've I've learned I've grown. Yeah, and, and when you say problems, you're talking about the complexity of challenges, maybe not actual yeah. problems that are causing you grief, just stuff yeah. that you're able to deal with and overcome now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and with with that, right? That was my mindset back then, right? Mm-hmm. That was my perspective back then. And this is my perspective now. It's a whole lot bigger. Yeah. And I believe when you grow, um, the, the perspective gets even bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and with with other people, right, other people uh, compare perspectives, right, and they, they have a class because they believe in their perspective. And this is the thing they, they have a problem with, like someone else is challenging their beliefs, yeah. which the – the, the the mind and, and body doesn't like someone challenging their beliefs because their beliefs have, have kept them alive. But with with just understanding and like emotion like um emotionally intelligence, right, and understanding like the energy is is, 
is huge, absolutely huge. Mate, as we get to the end of the episode, if somebody wanted to find out more about you, get in touch with you, uh, speak to you anyway, where would be the best place that they could go? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, the best place is Facebook, really. We'll put a link on the show yeah, notes sure. to the Facebook page, yeah. uh, Facebook slash Peter Dempsey, I would imagine yeah. it would be something simple like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, either, either way, like, and it's just a, it's just about under getting in touch with people that that can help you, right? and that you generate that you like to, that you like to know. And I'm open to open to anyone that that needs help or support or um, wants to do what do what I do. Really, I would encourage people, especially mums or dads or anybody who's been affected by stroke, that needs to ask a question or that wants to just share what it is that they're going through to get in touch with either myself or Peter. Leave a yep. comment on Facebook, you know, leave a comment on the YouTube channel and leave a comment on the website, wherever, and um, I'll get those in, that information back to Peter if you didn't happen to get to him directly. But either way, like, we'd love to hear from people. We'd love to help out. And if there's anything that we can do, you know, we'd be keen. Um, and just know that stroke is a journey, Peter, like, it's mm. not something that you're going to wake up from one day and go away. It won't. Um, it's something that we've got to work with and we've got to find ways to overcome. And if yeah. you can be creative and, you know, if you can, you know, have the right kind of support like you, we can even, I don't know, what uh, what was it, like 20 years later, still regain the use of whether it's a limb or whether it's get our speech back or something like that. Like there's still hope for ongoing recovery and to never yeah. ever give up right yeah yeah um and that, that's that's the best thing like it, it might um it might take it might take a short time it might take a long time but it's just about um understanding that process and enjoying the journey right mm. and, I, and i think it's important but also to tell people it's okay to get shitty upset cranky <laughs> mad, you know feel yeah. bad have a bad yeah. day yell at somebody like all that stuff's yeah. okay too, right? We're not perfect. We don't get to be perfect and and sort of be cranky at ourselves because our energy levels were depleted and we feel really we felt really bad and we reacted in a way, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, there, there is there is so many times I felt um, I felt angry and and frustrated and and things like that, um, but I've learned in the past. Uh, maybe ten years. It's about how to how do you influence those those emotions. So, um, don't yell at people, right? Yell at the ocean, right? So call 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 the ocean uh, like um every name under the sun, right? The ocean doesn't care, yeah. right? The ocean can take it. Um, and apologize um, if you do yell at people, like I have. <laughs> apologize yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, apologize and, and buy buy them a coffee or something yeah. like that. Right? But, it's a definitely about us changing ourselves, but also the people yeah. around us also yeah. changing themselves and not and giving themselves an opportunity to learn as well, learn about what's happening around mm. them and mm. that it's not necessarily, oh, that person's been cranky again or shitty again. Like what's going on for that person that you're not aware about today that's made them cranky or shitty? Yeah, and for yeah. somebody who's recovering from a stroke, like it could have been a million things that went wrong for that person to help yeah. them overcome, uh, you know, to help them get cranky. And some of the things we don't talk about, you know, because I, um, it's not some of the things that I haven't touched on yet on my podcast is like some people, unfortunately, you know, will soil themselves. They won't be able to get to the loo on time. You know, some people. Yeah, you know, won't be able to tie their shoelace or won't be able to do things that we take for granted. And it's kind of like mm. so many things can go wrong for somebody with a disability mm. to mm. be cranky. Let's just observe and ask and just sort of be more curious rather than responsive yeah. and reactive. You know? Curiosity, right? That, that, that's, the, that's a big thing, right? Be curious about other people, right? Um, if they have a disability or not a disability. Um, and what, one of the things I, I, I like to suspension is like i don't like to call it a disability mm. right because 